thought it would be a great way to start this talk by putting up a quote that uh, inspires me to no end. Inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us get up every day and get to work. Now, I love inspiration. And unfortunately, it's something I don't experience that often. What I do experience every day of my life is work. I go to work to do jobs. Um, the weekends feel like work sometimes when you have a seven and nine year old. Um, it's wonderful, but it feels work. And as I was introduced, I, you know, I, I started off as a musician. And it, the, the rock star thing didn't really work out. And um, I stopped playing at 19, 20 years old. I was completely burnt out. I had been practicing four to eight hours a day. It was just a very intense experience. And I uh, spent about four years floundering around, working at a, a Mexican restaurant called Nacho Mama's. Um, <laughs> just, just, I went to Hunter, for, uh, Hunter College for half a semester. And uh, I thought I was going to be some kind of therapist. Um, I imagine there's a few people here who wanted to be therapists at some point. Um, but anyway, I decided to um, ask my father, who's an illustrator, if I could uh, work for him. He had a studio called Slim Films back in the early 90s. And um, one of my first illustrations was something like this. Not necessarily inspired, but it certainly serves a function. It is an information graphic of sorts. The inspiration behind doing this when I started was money. <laughs> I needed to pay my rent. And um, I had an artistic background. My mother's a painter. And um, I thought, you know, I could draw pictures and make some money. That would be great. So it was a pretty mundane reason I was doing this. Now, after working for my father for about a year, I took a job at Scientific American. Now, um, Scientific American, this isn't what the magazine looked like when I was there. Um, but uh, Scientific American is the longest uh, longest published magazine in North America, I believe, continuously published. I think it started in the 1850s, 1860s. So, you know, I have this background in music. My mother's an oil painter. She worships at the altar of Jackson Pollock and Willem de Kooning. That means both aesthetically and personally. So, um, just, there was a lot of passion and energy and crazy artist friends in, in my childhood. And when I went into music, I still had that passion and that, that excitement. And I gave up on it when I was 19 and just was interested in making money so I could survive, frankly. Um, you know, I uh, was talking to Erica, my studio manager, just, just yesterday. And when I stopped playing music, it, it, it was a divorce. There, there, it, it was something I just finally stopped. I, I couldn't do it anymore. There's a lot of love there. There's a lot of passion there. But it worked when I was younger, and it doesn't work anymore. So anyway, I gave up on, on that life. Now, Scientific American was, a, was an eye-opening experience for me. The editors there had this love for science that completely blew me away. They were so passionate about things from the smallest subatomic particle to you know, cosmological things <laughs> that, that blew me away. They had a library at the magazine, at the, in the offices, that had every single back issue. And the aesthetics of the magazine, particularly from the 1960s, the 1950s through early 1970s, blew me away. Now, this, is a, this was a newsstand magazine. And I'm not sure if anyone could imagine a magazine looking like this now. I mean. The cover line is not 40 points large, and it's heat. <laughs> heat. <laughs> and it's this tr kind of triangle. It looks like modern art to me. Uh, so uh, this connection, the, the aesthetics behind the diagrams are just absolutely beautiful to me. Um, there was a purity to every drawing. Every mark in every information graphic had a meaning. There was nothing extraneous. The drawings to me were like, um, served almost as a window that you looked through to the content. I think I've heard type designers talk about type as if it should be a, a wine glass. 
something that's relatively invisible so you can enjoy the contents of the wine. These diagrams were purely for the content of science to me. And because of that, they resonated with beauty. Um, this thing, <laughs> I mean, this to me vaguely reminds me of Keith Haring, but it's pure data. It's pure data. It's just numbers. Yet it creates this beautiful, me, to me, beautiful thing. <laughs> this, this beautiful uh, graphic. Um, so, you know, b back in the 60s, most magazines were printing primarily with just black ink, and then occasionally you'd use magenta or cyan or, or, or second color. Now, those limitations actually worked out very well for, for these scientific diagrams because one thing I started to realize is that color is meaning. And with these diagrams, color is, is, is meaning. So it's just beautiful. And they, you know, I've always been a big fan of Mondrian. And something about the reductive nature of these reminded me of his work. So I want to show you a piece I did in 96, which to this day is my favorite piece I've ever done. And uh, it's an information graphic. I have no clue what this means. And it's a fucking information graphic. You know, I, I ran through my talk with my wife, um, and she said I, I have a, a, a tendency to undercut myself, but not necessarily in a negative way. And I mean, I've shown this diagram a few times at talks. And I, I still love it. There's a sense of humor behind it. It's anthropomorphic. It's a Feynman diagram. And it's showing the process of um, gluons interacting. And it reads from bottom to top. Unfortunately, I, I wish it read from left to right, because it, that's kind of intuitively how it feels it does. But anyway, this is, this is my favorite thing I've ever done. This is back in 96. There's nothing extraneous. Every line means something. And it's, it's you know, I think pretty, the word pretty gets a bad rap nowadays, but it's pretty to look at. It's, it's nice. Um, so I was at Scientific American for a year, and um, I decided to leave to do the music thing. And um, I went back to music school, to a conservatory, and um, worked as a freelance illustrator to, to pay the bills. I realized I didn't have what it takes to be a musician. I didn't have the energy. But I was making money as an illustrator, and it was coming relatively easily. Um, the, the one key problem was that diagrams like I showed you of mine, that, that, that Feynman diagram, I couldn't find any outlet for that work. But what I did have experience in was as a 3D illustrator, a digital 3D illustrator. Now, back in the mid to late 90s, I don't know how familiar you guys are with, but 3D illustration was like one, just about one of the ugliest things imaginable. Um, it was awful. So I want to show you some of the work I did from that period. And I think this stuff is just awful. I mean, the, 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 the dictum I went by was, um, if it looks like shit, just add a glow or a lens flare. I mean, <laughs> um, so that, you know, that should help it out. So, yeah. So, you know, I went from color being meaning to color being puke on this. Um, uh, you know, lens flares from one thing and then glows. I think everything is glowing on this. Um, <laughs> although the robot on the, uh, he's not glowing. And, and I think my favorite thing is a star field about this. Um, but, so that's another piece. Now this is the creme de la creme of my work from this period, I think. I don't know what the hell I was thinking. What was going on in my mind when I decided the cell nucleus should be an avocado? This lurid green background, I can't begin to understand. This dude, you know, he looks Caucasian. He's blue. <laughs> and he has an afro. So it's like, it's, you know, but, and I, I just wanted to say a little bit, I worked so hard on these diagrams. <laughs> I spent, I spent like weeks, pulled all-nighters working on these things. I worked so hard on these, but I was kind of miserable. I mean, uh, let's see, what's the last one? Oh, this. <laughs> it's an elephant. <laughs> in a blue ball. Um, and this actually was illustrated for Scientific American on a story on physics. Now, you remember a couple of years ago I had done this, my favorite piece. <laughs> and this is what I was doing now. So I was miserable. I was, I was just com completely miserable. I didn't, know, I didn't know what to do. Um, 
you know, I, I talked about how earlier when I became an illustrator, money was the inspiration behind it to, to just pay bills and live my life. And I, at this point in my career, I was, I was making decent money. And that was, that was quite nice. But I was dying inside a little bit. I started uh, doing some research, looking around. And I came across um, John Grimwade, his, his website. Now, John Grimwade um, is a, just, in my opinion, he's my favorite working information graphics artist today. And his work completely blew me away. Now, there's a possibility that his work might look a little of its time right now, but compositionally, color-wise, as far as color being meaning, it's, it's written all over it. The, 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 uh, the map on the upper left reminds me of Malevich almost. Um, there, there was just a clarity to these diagrams that, that shimmered. I thought. He's using white as a color, which very few illustrators in the information graphics world know, know how to do. But he's using, white is a color here. So um, I, you know, I, I looked through his work, and it just, it just blew me away. Um, I mean, these shapes, the way he's choosing to lay out these shapes is beautiful. So I emailed him. He didn't really know me, but I emailed him this incredibly effusive email. It took him three weeks to get back to me. And those were like, three of the longest weeks of my life. I felt so, I was really embarrassed. I mean, this email was so ridiculously effusive. So anyway, I wound up having lunch with him. And he told me he had, he had hope for 3D, for digital 3D, but he thought like we had to look to the past. Um, we needed to, as a 3D artist, we needed to look to, to the past and get some inspiration from things. So I went back to, to the well and started looking at Scientific American diagrams from the 60s again. I mean, look at the line work on that long and heart illustration. It's just, it's just gorgeous, I think. Again, this is beautiful. So I was thinking about this, and I was commissioned by Scientific American at the time to do a diagram on the, uh, the life cycle of a virus. And um, that earliest thing with Mr. Blue, um, that was basically the same illustration. So I thought about it, thought about it, realized I could strip away the color. The most important thing of a virus life cycle is basically the DNA and RNA. So I created this. <clears throat> in the past, I would have made the virus and the cell membrane different colors. I would have, you remember the avocado cell membrane? I would have done that. But this has just about, this has 90% of the information that this piece has. Yeah, it's nice to look at. So that was the beginning of me embracing 3D, of realizing that there, there was an aesthetic backbone to it, that it can be used beautifully, or, well, can, you know, approach beauty. Um, so um, this led to a commission for a Newsweek cover. I, Bruce Ramsey, one of my favorite art directors, commissioned me to do this based on that virus diagram. Um, it was on lung cancer. And, um, you know, this, this whole idea of using two colors <clears throat> can, for information graphics can stretch out to many different areas. So. I mean, I'm ripping off that color palette for, for an architectural diagram I did about a building that uses um, wind for its energy source. Before my wife and I um, started our family, we took a last gasp vacation. We uh, went to Italy. And we stayed in um, uh, Tuscany for a week. And then we went to Rome. And when in Rome, one goes to the Vatican. and. Uh, I hated it. Um, I didn't go to the Sistine Chapel. It was, it was closed that day. But we walk into the Vatican, and the whole thing is designed to scare the living shit out of you. <laughs> it's, you know, it's these incredible vaulted ceilings. It's, there's these statues and sculptures that are leaning out of these apses that look like they're going to fall on you. I mean, it's really designed to, I, I mean, I, I, I just hated it. Yet, there's this guy named Michelangelo. And yeah, he did design the, the dome, I guess, but, and that was great. But, um, but there's this guy named Michelangelo, and there's this sculpture he did called the Pieta that's in there. And it just completely floored me. To me, it felt, this might be very idiosyncratic, but to me, it felt very subversive. To me, this sculpture 
felt like it was getting to the kind of the concrete concept or something of Christianity, of just showing a mother's sorrow for her executed son. In the midst of all this pomp and circumstance, there was such a heart of sorrow, of humanity, of love. It just, it was a spiritual experience for me. Um, you know, I, I got all weepy looking at it. It, it, was, it was amazing. Now, and as you remember, at the time, this is what I was doing. <laughs> So I was a little bit humbled. So that, that opened my eyes to the potential for like, depicting the human form. Um, we got back from Italy, and uh, I was commissioned a week later by Scientific American again. Now, I do do work for other clients other than Scientific American. I just, I just want to let you guys know that. But um, I was commissioned by Scientific American to do a, a, a diagram on stress and its effects on the body. So. Um, I got this editor's sketch, and I, I love editor's sketches. There's a simplicity to them, a, a directness. I just, I, I just, I, I really want to publish a book on just editor's sketches. Now, in case you didn't notice, you can all read that. <laughs> so, <laughs> isn't, isn't that great? <laughs> So, um, uh, this was the potential for expressing emotion, like stress, frankly. This is what the body could look like in art. This is what I was doing. So, I just, I, I kind of, I was fucked. <laughs> you know, the story was about stress, and I don't want to have Mr. Purple or Blue standing there. So, I... Um, I thought about it and thought about it and thought about it and looked at that Michelangelo work and came up with this. This was the beginning of my, my figure work that wasn't repulsive. <laughs> it opened a lot of doors for my career. You know, it, it, this, this woman doesn't look relatively happy. Um, so th that, that was the beginning. And because of that, I got commissioned by um, the New York Times to do a story on diabetes. Now, you remember that editor sketch? You, sometimes we get a, a brief that's drawn out, we know what to do. Sometimes you get a brief that's this. Woman, okay, brain, heart, pancreas, skeleton, that, that's, that's it. I didn't read the story, so I'm not sure what else to put into it, is what she says. <laughs> <laughs> so, and of course, this is going to press in three days. And then she sends me this. That's a lot of fucking room. That's a lot. That's that's a, that's a that's a huge canvas to work with. So I was I was petrified. I had no idea what to do. So I went back to the well, and started looking at some of the fine art I love. Ang, I mean, come on, look at those lines. <laughs> I mean, it just kills me. Which reminds me very much of Henry Moore, the kind of sinuous quality. Da Vinci. I'll talk a little bit about Da Vinci later. Now you know I grew up with de Kooning. He knows pink and oranges like no, no one else. So I, I started to hone in on what I wanted. And with this Michelangelo Sybil, I started to get a sense of what I wanted to do. And that led to this, this Matisse paper cutout. And I realized I wanted that expression to happen. And uh, from there, I started drawing. This is what my uh, drafting table looked at at the time. Um, I had a feeling this was going to be a very special job when I, did, when I took it on. So I actually drew, or rather took a photograph of the process. A little self-important, I guess. But, but anyway, um, I, um, you know, I started sketching some things out. You'll notice there's no head because I can't draw faces. Um, and um, from here, went into this nightmare land program called Poser. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with it. But uh, from, from there, I went to this. And this is what was looking at me on the monitor. So I, I, I didn't know what to do. I, um, started working on many different poses, playing with the layout. You'll notice on the, on the right-hand side, each one of those layers is a different pose and a different camera angle. I went through a lot of things, and then finally settled on two poses. And I sent uh, the, Kelly Doe, the art director, these two. She chose the one on the right. And this is the process. From there, I, I filled in the organs, the you know, skeleton, woman OK, pancreas, liver, skeleton. So I highlighted those came to this, 
And then here's the, the final illustration, a crappy photograph of it in the newspaper, and then the, the final illustration by itself. So that, that's, that's the process that goes behind the, the work. Um, now, I have uh, three minutes left, and i um, halfway through my talk. <laughs> I timed myself uh, last night, and it, it took me 25 minutes. So I, I guess I'm either talking really slowly, and I, I apologize. <laughs> Or I'm just um, ad-libbing a little too much. So let's see. I, I might skip through some of these things kind of quickly. Um, da Vinci, for me, the, the father of information graphics. I know people did information graphics before him, but this, for me, is beautiful because it's complete truth. Everything he drew, everything he painted, everything he attempted to sculpt, uh, he never got... Most of his sculptures never came off the ground. Um, we're informed by anatomical truths, by the way light interacts. Science informed just about everything he did. So over the last couple of years, I've been taking a lot of inspiration from him because the work I do, the work my studio does, is all science related, basically. So I was working on that. And that led us to create this uh, 3D model of the circulatory system of the hand. So, hands were on my brain. <laughs> and um, I was reading a book on vertebrate morphology and came across this um, diagram ontogeny, on ontogeny. It, it really blew me away at the time um, to see the similarities at, at this stage of development between, you know, you got a fish looking like a snake, looking like a bird. I mean, talk about interconnectedness. That, that, that blew me away. So I had this idea to do just art of hands of different species hands, basically. I pitched the idea to National Geographic. We sent them the, this, this idea, which is a, a human hand, a manatee, and a bat wing. And a bat wing is basically a hand. They said yes. We worked with scientists to get all the anatomical materials we needed to do. Started modeling it in 3D. And uh, from there created this. This is an eye eye hand. We created this bat wing. Now, this, this, the, the style of this is informed by that Da Vinci drawing I showed you. I, you know, I, 3D work can t tend to be cold, but I like warmth. An elephant foot. This is probably one of the favorite, my favorite illustrations we've produced. This thing, this is a Da Vinci sketch. And this is a Da Vinci sketch that shows multiple angles of people on top of each other. There was some guy named Picasso, who I thought did it for the first time 600 years later. Look at that. <laughs> I mean, that, that just blows me away. So uh, this feeling of this work has informed my fine art, which is using anatomical truths, too. This model is the same model as that human hand I showed you, but it's rendered in a different way. And I'm using time. I'm using multiple angles. Each one of these hands is, shot for, is the same hand shot from a different angle. Overlaid, they start to take on dimensionality. This led to video installations I've been doing. Um, this is another overlay of a woman standing from 12 different angles. I'm experimenting with encaustic. Now, I just want to finish with one quote by Einstein. This is a video installation that's based on that circulatory um, model I made of the hand. The most beautiful experience we can have is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion which stands at the cradle of true art and true science. Whoever does not know it and can no longer wonder, no longer marvel, is as good as dead, and his eyes are dimmed. I mean, that, that gets me up in the morning, that idea. And that's, uh, Einstein said that. So, uh, I'm two minutes over. Thank you very much. That's all I got.